Welcome to Downpour.com's interview series. I'm Malcolm Hillgartner, and today it's my pleasure to be speaking with Jeff Perlman. Perlman is a New York Times bestselling author and sports writer. He's the author of several books, including the highly acclaimed bestsellers Sweetness, The Bad Guys Won, and Boys Will Be Boys. He is a contributing writer to The Wall Street Journal, Sports Illustrated, and CNN.com. Perlman is also a former columnist for SportsIllustrated.com and ESPN.com, a senior writer for Sports Illustrated, and a staff writer for Newsday. Blackstone Audio published the audio version of Jeff Perlman's latest history, Showtime, Magic, Kareem, Riley, and the Los Angeles Lakers dynasty of the 1980s, simultaneously with the hardcover book on March 4, 2014. Welcome, Jeff. Congratulations on the release of Showtime. Let's talk about Showtime. What inspired you to write about the great Los Angeles Lakers dynasty of the 1980s? I'm a kid of the 80s. I'm 41. So my prime sports fandom came in the 80s. And I actually grew up a pretty diehard New Jersey Nets fan. And with the exception of like Buck Williams and Pearl Washington every now and then, the Nets were terrible. So the attention was always Boston, LA, and a little Philly back in the 80s. And to me, LA was just glitz and glamour and larger than life. And I grew up in this small, tiny town in upstate New York and, you know, Magic Johnson and Kareem and, and then Pat Riley and James Worthy. And it just was like, to me, it was dazzle and excitement and neon. I'm really into the nostalgia element of books. And I love diving back into a subject that I loved as a kid and being able to see what happened behind it. When you're watching on TV, you see one thing. But then to really learn the makeup and the, the inner workings, it, it's really exciting and, for me, very thrilling. Tell us how the term Showtime came to be associated with the Lakers and that era. Well, it's funny. Jerry Buss bought the team in 1979 from Jack Kent Cooke. And he was this guy from Wyoming. He was an engineer. But he was really, he was really cool, for lack of a better word. He was just a cool guy. He liked to go out. He was a party guy. And uh, he used to go to this club in L.A., just a small, you know, sort of nondescript club. And when the acts would come on to start the night, the announcer would always go, it's showtime. And it really stuck with Jerry Buss, and he really liked that. And one thing he wanted to do was turn a Laker game from a basketball game into an event. He always said if someone was coming into town and wanted to see a celebrity, he wanted them to know the place to go was a Laker game at the Forum. So he made sure that all the big names in town were going. So that's how you got Jack Nicholson and Diane Cannon and Lou Adler and a million other celebrities. There were no dancers at games before Jerry Buss started the Laker Girls. He got rid of an organ player and he brought in the marching band at USC to play the games. And they, they start blaring in music. So actually the NBA you see today with the lights and the pizzazz, and it's sometimes over the top in my opinion, but the NBA you see today is a byproduct of Jerry Buss and Showtime. Those Lakers were far more than just the glitz of Hollywood. I mean, Magic Johnson, Kareem, you know, Michael Cooper, James Worthy, iconic players of the era. What was it like to uh, try to get under the skin of those people? I mean, how did you go about getting into this book and researching those characters? Were you able to talk to Magic and the others? That... It's a very intensive thing, researching a book. I take about two years to do it. You know, you really hunker down. I probably go through 15,000 articles in the course of researching. I did for this book about 200 interviews. The goal is to interview absolutely everyone. And for me, to be honest with you, the real joy is finding the obscure players. Like, uh, just as an example, they had a backup point guard named Wes Matthews, who was a real feisty, tough guy from Bridgeport, Connecticut, not a great area of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I tracked him down, and we spent about two to three hours in a diner in Bridgeport together. And this guy was just so happy to talk about his memories because no one had asked him about this stuff in years and years. You know, and I, I travel up to Canada, to Niagara, to meet Mike Smreck, a backup center on his farm. I go to a cheesecake factory in Miami and sit with Billy Thompson. To me, I love getting the stories and I love talking to the guys who haven't told their stories. So you interview the stars and that's great and it's important. But to me, where you end up getting your money material in a book, in a biography, is by speaking to the people beneath the surface, the guys who were there, who were part of it, who enjoyed it, but maybe haven't told their stories a gazillion times. Full disclosure here to everyone that I was able to narrate this book for Blackstone, and it was an absolute gas to read and to narrate. I absolutely love the fact that you did go out and get those stories of some of the other players and some of the people behind the scenes as well. I mean, you know, Mitch Kupchak and Kurt Rambis. And some of the best information, it seemed to me, you got was from the wives. Talk about that, how you got access to them. I feel like some of those women have become almost like friends. 
they're perfect because they're participants and observers, but their material is very fresh because wives are, are seldom interviewed. So one of my favorite people in the world has become Wanda Cooper, Michael Cooper's ex-wife. And the funny thing is, Michael Cooper was the one, even though they're divorced, he's the one who encouraged me to go talk to his wife. You know, he's like, if, if you want to hear really great information, this is who you talk to. And the other one, Linda Rambis, Kurt's wife, who has worked for the Lakers for years and years and years, just tremendous. And what I like about this experience for me is it's like interviewing people about their really fun college days. It's not like scandalous. It's not dirty. It's like, it's fun. And they're looking back when they were 22, 23, 24, 25 and thinking, man, life was really carefree and life was really fun. And we had an opportunity to do this thing that very few people in the world get to do. And I would love to talk to you about it. And that's what's really, for me, is, is sort of gratifying about it all. We have to come back eventually to the marquee personalities of the team. I mean, Magic, Kareem. I've always understood, and certainly from the book, we learn what a difficult, to put it mildly, character Kareem was. How did you get information about him? Or were you able to get him to open up to you? Because he seemed really difficult in terms of reaching out with people. Awkward. The thing about Kareem that I always say is like, if you just read about him as a Laker, you would think, God, what a jerk. He was horrible with autographs. He was terrible with kids. He was not a nice guy to be around. He wasn't easy. He was difficult. But when you really get into it, when you really dig into his life, you realize he grew up in a very sort of racist world. He was this kid in New York. You know, you went into stores, people followed you around. He was enormous from the time he was, he was a baby, really. And a lot of his boyhood and his developmental years, he was more of a museum piece than he was a kid. People saw him as a freak and they treated him as a freak. And I think he had a really scarring moment in high school. He went to Power Memorial High School and he went there because he really liked the coach. And one day after a game when they lost, the coach comes into the locker room and says, starts yelling at everyone. And he says to Kareem, his name was Lou Alcindor at the time, he said, you're playing like a blank using the N-word. And it was like everything stopped. And I think he just grew up in a world where he didn't trust people, where people probably took advantage of him. He had an agent who really did him wrong and took a lot of his money. So I think when you see the standoffish and you see the guardedness, it's a byproduct of an upbringing. Some of the things I really like about the way you write, one, your fearlessness and getting under the skin of some of these people. And what happens is we get this really three-dimensional person. We don't get a glossy showpiece, and they stay human for us. And I love that with Kareem because we see his rough edges, but we never lose sight of the humanity underneath. Conversely, like moving over to Magic, another iconic figure, uh, really emblematic of not just that time, but of basketball in general for a lot of reasons. And the popular perception of him is of this almost genial teddy bear. And I loved how you got in under that and showed the really tough side of Magic in terms of how he ran his team, how he ran his life, and also some of the more irresponsible sides of him, too. Talk about that a little bit. How did you get that information? He's really interesting. My wife said the other day, he's the hero of your book. And I actually feel that way. He is the hero of the book. When your best player and your most talented player is also your hardest worker and your leader, it's remarkable. I and mean, we saw that with Walter Payton. I mean, he, it's remarkable. And he was that guy. It's really interesting. Like, he caught a lot of grief. Early on in his career, he was sort of the force behind the coach Paul Westhead getting fired. He basically said to Jerry Buss, this isn't going to work. And Jerry Buss fired Paul Westhead. And Magic was destroyed in the papers and the media for a while. And by fans, he was booed by fans because he was thought as a coach killer. Well, 90% of the Laker roster didn't like Paul Westhead as a coach. And they all thought he should be fired. Magic was the one who at least had this sort of chutzpah to stand up and do something about it. You know, there are a lot of guys who are whispering about it, who would talk off the record to the media. Magic put his mouth where his thoughts were. I actually think it was really unjustified for him to catch a lot of grief. He was in an interestingly awkward spot because you had him and you had Kareem. And Kareem was this iconic figure, but not personable at all. And Magic was this newer guy, and he was extremely personal. And he and Jerry Buss, the owner, became fast friends and running buddies. And they, they would hang out at the Playboy Mansion with Hugh Hefner. They would go out to different bars and clubs, and, and they became this almost like an item. And for Kareem, it was very uncomfortable. And he did not like that. He didn't think a player should be best friends with the owner. But I always thought that Magic handled it very well because he was always deferential to Kareem. It was never, this is my team. He would never, ever look off Kareem in the post. If Kareem was calling for the ball, Kareem got the ball. He was that kind of guy. He knew how to balance things very, very, very well. 
your descriptions of the games and particularly the way Magic played and the way the Lakers played in those games. And I, I saw a lot of those games either on TV or I was living in Seattle at the time and I saw them play the Sonics in 80. And I was so aware at the time of Magic being such a great playmaker, floor general. I'd forgotten how he could dominate a game with his scoring when needed to. Upon reading your book, I wound up going back and YouTubing clips of him. And you do a great job of bringing that to life to us because I saw those clips and it was jaw-dropping to see what a fantastic player he was. How would you contrast the Lakers teams of the 80s and their style of play with what we see in the NBA today? Well, I think in a way, oftentimes today, I'm not just saying this because I wrote the book. I've actually, I've been thinking about that a fair amount. I feel like today is kind of a weak, it's a watered down imitation a little bit. The Miami Heat are probably the best, the most comparable team to the Lakers. You know, the Lakers had all these pieces that other teams didn't have. Like with Miami today, it seems like they took the three stars and then they fill in around them and it works okay. The Lakers, people had purposes, like specific purposes, and they were there with great intent and forethought. For example, Kurt Rambis, people saw him and they said, oh, this guy, some goon forward with funny glasses, what can he do? Well, he was the best inbounder anyone had ever seen. And when the other team would score, he would grab the ball and in one motion, I'm actually doing it with my hands, he would whip it in to Magic or to Norm Nixon or whoever was cutting up the court. And he did it better than anyone. James Worthy was just this guy. He had these long arms and he was a slasher and he filled the lanes so well. When they traded Norm Nixon and they got Byron Scott, all of a sudden they had this beautiful spot up shooter. So if anyone's penetrating, Magic's penetrating, or, or James Worthy's penetrating, or Michael Cooper's penetrating, you kick it back out. Byron Scott's wide open. Then you have Michael Cooper, this lockdown defender. So if you need to guard a Larry Bird or you need to guard a Tiny Archibald or anyone in between, you have this lockdown defender, the best defender, probably perimeter defender in the NBA, who you could put on him. So they had all these different pieces, and they had a Mitch Kupchak for physicality. They would always bring in different guards, and they all fit in these perfect ways. So I feel like Jerry West was the master, the GM, was the master builder of a team and he knew how to fit pieces perfectly into places when they got bob mcadoo for example everyone thought well of course bob mcadoo is going to start over kurt rambis i mean the guy was a superstar and jerry west and pat riley no this guy's coming off the bench he's a perfect scorer off the bench and it's going to work well and it did and they just did that very very well they piece things together better than any organization i've ever seen this marvelous collection of strong individuals but somehow they melded into team and that seems to be the biggest difference between then and now. And especially the way you describe Magic, the way he's fixated on creating a team. I mean, there were egos, but they didn't play out. Like years later with the Lakers, Shaq and Kobe could never get along. Never had that with Magic and Cream. Even though there were times like Magic got a 25-year, $25, $25 million contract from Jerry Buss. And, and Kareem was upset and he spoke out briefly. And Magic didn't really care. And when there were egos, the only real ego battle they had of any real note was Norm Nixon and Magic Johnson. They got rid of Norm Nixon. They said, okay, goodbye. And they got Byron Scott. It actually worked out brilliantly. Describe the impact of Magic's announcement that he had HIV, how that changed the game, and also how that would have played out in today's environment. I would say there are only two events from my lifetime that I kind of compare, put in the same grouping. And some people have said like 9-11, the shock of 9-11. I think that's too extreme to be honest with you. But I think actually three, the OJ chase, when Lenny Bias died, and when the Challenger exploded. Those are three moments with magic from my younger days. We were just like, oh my, oh my God, what? Oh my God. And what it really did for sports and certainly for the NBA is it was a huge eye opener because there was so much sex going on. I'm sure there still is, but there was so much unprotected sex going on. And all of a sudden, guys were like, oh my, oh my God, oh my God. If this can happen to Magic Johnson, I better get my AIDS test. And tons and tons and tons of NBA players were running out to get tests. It was really the kickoff, I feel like, to safe sex in professional sports and this idea that you can't just sleep around with groupies and have the time of your life without thinking about it. So I think the impact was absolutely absolutely enormous. Yeah, when he made that announcement, it really was like the air went out of our collective basketball room. It was just deflating in a horrific sense at the time. I really think it's true. He is as close as we've come to a Muhammad Ali type figure in sports, like a universally beloved, iconic figure with that smile. Just like Ali had the trademark wit about him, Magic Johnson has the best smile anyone has ever seen. And he just enters a room and there's a certain joy to him. And it's not a cliche. It's really true. He walks into a room and there's something about him that lights it up. 
And yeah, he had his flaws, as we all do, but he just was really this larger than life presence. And to see it happen to him, of all people, him, the only other person in sports who would have been as shocking was if it had been Muhammad Ali. And with him with Parkinson's, we've seen it in a slower, but also equally shocking sort of way. Do you think it's possible that there may be another team that could emerge out of today's environment with the same sort of dominance on the sport? You have more player movement now than you had then. So that makes it very difficult. I guess Miami Heat could go on right now and win the next six NBA titles. And we'd say, ah, another Showtime type dynasty. But I really think if you take into account the figures on that team, and then you throw in the coach, Pat Riley, this iconic coach, and then you throw in the GM, and then you throw in the playboy owner, and then you throw in Los Angeles in the 80s and sort of this wild city, this wild time to, to be in that city. I don't think you'll ever have a true duplicate. There'll be copies but I don't think you can ever really duplicate what happened with that Showtime era. If you were to synopsize in 25 words or less, what you wanted people to take away from listening or hearing Showtime, what would it be? More than anything, I think it's about the joy. It's about when sports was a little less complicated and a little less intermingled with business and everything is about selling, 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 $40 for the T-shirt, <laughs> $20 for the pin. And it was just about great basketball and larger-than-life personalities and a really, really fun city at a really fun time. Did you play sports as a kid? I did. I'm not trying to brag, but I was one of the, uh, I would say at the University of Delaware, I may have been one of the worst 100 Division One cross-country runners in America. I think a lot of us have those kind of hallmark traits in our past. I was a profoundly mediocre basketball player. <laughs> we should team up. But that was enough to uh, get you into sports writing. Describe the arc of your career. How did you come to writing sports and then writing these terrific books. I was in high school, Mayo Pack High School, Mayo Pack, New York, and I wanted to write for the high school paper, and I was writing all these boring stories for the high school paper. And one day I wrote a story about why cheerleading isn't really a sport. It comes out, and I'm just like this geeky runner, zits and skinny and not that social. And I write this story about cheerleading not being a sport. This paper comes out, and all of a sudden I'm surrounded by angry cheerleaders. And I'm like this 16-year-old kid just staring at him like, oh, oh my God, this is amazing. And they're all screaming at me. I'm like, oh my God, this, this writing thing is, pre is pretty good. All of a sudden, the cheerleaders are talking to me. Now, they might hate me, but they know who I am finally. That's not why I write now. I write now just I really love writing. I love digging. I love the process. But my eye-opener was being a kid and seeing when you write and you have something to say, people take note. I went on to write for my college newspaper at the University of Delaware, went on eventually to Sports Illustrated and really fell in love with just writing and watching something and paying attention to the details and getting the stories and being able to hear. I love how you're able to ask any question you want. If you're a stockbroker and you go up to someone at work and you say, so what was it like battling cancer? The person might think that's absolutely none of your business. I feel like as a journalist, you have a little invisible badge that says this guy's allowed to ask you questions. So I, I really love that. I just love listening to people talk. You've done John Rocker, you've done Roger Clemens, you've done Walter Payton, Sweetness, which I also had the pleasure of narrating. And now you've done the Showtime Lakers. What's coming up? I don't actually know. I have a dream book that no one will let me write. My dream book is to write a biography of the United States Football League, which uh, existed from 1983 to 1985 and is my all-time, all-time favorite sports league. But nobody wants a book on it. And it's kind of starting to break my heart. I think this is an opportunity for a Kickstarter campaign. Thank you. Thanks again, Jeff. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this Downpour.com interview with Jeff Perlman. You can find Showtime and Sweetness on audiobook, as well as all of Blackstone Audio's titles, at Downpour.com.